Hi, everyone. Sorry, I'm back again. The internet gods interceded or all of those kids on Zoom. Apologies in advance if we have any more technical issues, but hopefully we just got them out of the way. Just gonna start this from the top again. Welcome to the August Goop Book Club, where we have the great pleasure of discussing Raven Leilani's book, Luster, which is so spicy, so beautifully written, so told, well told. Um, for those who maybe read the book, several weeks ago and need a reminder. It's a story of Edie, a 20 something black woman who maybe should be a painter, um, who works in publishing and is fired for being sexually inappropriate. And then her, I wouldn't call it a love story, her dating story, her relationship with an older white man, 23 years older who um, named Eric, who's in an open marriage. It's also about her relationship with his wife um, and touches on so many major themes. We have, I don't know, six pages of pull quotes. Um, it's funny, it's wise, it's prescient. Um, and I could keep going, but let's talk to Raven. I just wanna remind you that you can ask questions in the chat and we'll get to as many as possible. But without further ado, instant New York Times bestseller, Raven Leilani. Hi. Hi. We're back. I really love the sound of that instant New York Times bestseller. <laughs> and I want to say thank you for, for having me. This is wonderful. Thanks for joining us. I'm sure it's been a wild ride. How are you doing and what has this been like? And now you can't celebrate it properly, which is unfortunate. Right. <laughs> we'll have to put off the, the celebration to like hopefully 2021. But um, it has really just been a really affirming um, that people are connecting with the book. Like it's it's a like a better and bigger response than I really honestly expected. Um, so it's just been, it's been a real dream. How long was this book growing in you before it came out? So, I mean, like, there's like a short and there's a long answer. So a year is kind of how long it took for me to write this. I wrote this in my MFA um, in the, at New York, NYU. Um, and I started it my second year after a couple of failed projects, you know, so I'd, I feel like I've been trying to make my way to this book for a long time. Um, and it kind of wasn't until I was surrounded by a community and had really, really great mentors and teachers that I found like, you know, I really found my voice on the page. So I would say like, you know, it took me a long time to get there, you know, um, but it took a year to just to actually get it all out. Yeah. Well, Edie is an amazing character. Um, so many incredibly memorable moments. And I um, was talking to Kiki about like just being inside of her and how that was such a pleasure. Um, and like the idea that this first date with this man was at Six Flags, which was yeah. so strange and startling and, and hilarious. And then she says things like, you are a desirable woman. You are not a dozen durables in a skin casing. So like, how did, <laughs> how did Edie come to you and how much of, how much of her is you and how much of her is an imaginal version of you and sure. where did it come from? So, I mean, there's like, I wouldn't say that this book is autobiography, but there is, there is so much of me in it. And like, just that line that you, that you pulled out, you know, is, is part of, what I wanted to be a fundamental part of her character, which is that she is a character who wants deeply and who yearns openly. And so like that, that quote that you pulled is, you know, her kind of in her pre-date routine trying to, <laughs> you know, force herself into human shape uh, because she's a character, she's not like disaffected, she's not cool, she cares a lot. And in this case, um, she's, you know, she cares about the projection, you know, that perhaps Eric, you know, the, the man she's seeing, uh, will see. Um, she's doing the business that you kind of see throughout the book where she is, you know, kind of acqui acquiescing to this demand of performance and trying to figure out the most palatable way, in some ways, um, to move through the world and to offer herself up as, to this man specifically. Um, so I wanted to write frankly, right, about, about desire, about, the way it feels to want, the way that can feel 
deranged, <laughs> you know, like I, I think there's a lot of me in that, you know, she is, um, I've since sort of put down painting, but um, painting was the first thing I ever really loved. And so the very first thing I ever struggled with. And so I wrote a lot of that grappling with like one's artistic limit. I wrote a lot of that in Edie. Um, and I wrote a lot of that want and that desire. Um, so I guess there's a lot of, in terms of, you know, there's a lot of me and her in that way. Yeah. No, and like the, the confusing parts of it and the messy parts of it um, and how th her desire and then her own internal desire, the, the wanting to be desired and then her own desires, like how contradictory they can be. Um, like that moment from her first date where she thinks, I want to be uncomplicated and undemanding. I want no friction between his fantasy and the person I actually am. I want all that and I want none of it, which I thought was just so, so yeah. true. I think it's one of the most relatable sentences I've read in months. Right, I mean, thank you. Um, you know, in that moment I was thinking about, you know, the first time you, you meet someone or, you know, I think maybe the first time, you know, you're a woman and you, you meet someone and you are aware of the way that you might present yourself to be palatable, <laughs> you know, uh, the, and in a way, like she gets carried away inside of her mind. Like she has sanctuary enough within her mind to kind of um, experience these, these hyperbolic, um, almost like fantasies of what could be if she were X. And in this case, X is an uncomplicated, sexy detour, which she understands in this arrangement um, would be, would work best, right? But which she is not. And so I think in that line, it's her, you know, her wish, right? To, to be wanted and to be loved and to make this connection that she's been sort of sussing out online for too long. Um, but it also is like the resignation um, of the performance that she knows is demanded of her and, and the kind of frustration that she cannot let that ooze out just yet. <laughs> yeah, and sort of that idea, like she talks about sort of being perceived by him as this cheap, fast Italian car, but yet she's so brilliant, right? Like she's so smart and like I love, this made me laugh too, just this line, like based on his liberal use of the semicolon, I just assumed this date would go well. And so, <laughs> I mean, you get the sense from her throughout that she's just this wild, brilliant woman who is, doesn't fit, right? Or just, but right. like that is waiting to be seen or perceived for who she is and not objectified. And then she sort of objectifies herself, but yes. is objectified. Yes, definitely. You know, and it's, it's funny, you know, I think um, at least with, with Eric, you know, she, you, you watch her kind of studying, you watch her calculating. She's on this date, but also watching this date almost from her mood because she is one, I mean, she's a black woman. So she is um, used to kind of being studious in the way that it allows her to survive. Um, but also it is that, right, it's that that desire to, to be able to let the mask slip a little bit. And, and Eric is, you know, at least compelling at first to her because he can he can exist in the world authentically. Like he doesn't really have to pretend. Um, and you know, like the the use of the semicolon. Like I, I had fun writing that. But like I used to have a teacher who um, what she would say about the semicolon <laughs> was that you'd take it out for for special occasions, like a Chanel bag. That's what she used to say. And so like that was sort of my way of of saying like. You know, this is a person who is, uh, Eric at least, is is robust and, and kind of like very earnest in his expression. And Edie is watching that from a remove, compelled by it, um, envious of it. Um, <laughs> you know, it's it's really, it's really, it was interesting writing that, writing that date and kind of describing how much she wants it, but um, how she's kind of studying it from a distance. Totally. And I think that that's so, that feels so universal, right? This idea, I think, as women that, and maybe it's just me in relating to, to Edie, but where it's so hard, I don't know many women 
granted, I'm sh this, I can't speak for all women, certainly, but like that give themselves over to sex fully, right? Like it feels like we're constantly um, observing, like you, yeah. you write about that sort of like the, the being part of it and in observation of it and in judgment of it, right? Yeah. Um, so in so many ways, she's wildly sexually liberated, right? And, the, and to the extent that it loses her, her job, I mean, that part was hilarious too, just like the litany of lovers that she had taken at work, which didn't feel sad to me. It right. felt, it actually felt, you know, like go for it, why not? But- that um, Like that was important to me to not pathologize her, yeah. you know, her bodily want, you know, like her, her bodily need. You know, I, I was important when I wrote this that um, that you be fully situated inside of her body and that you understand it's, it's drama, you know, like the, the drama that is, you know, intestinal, <laughs> you know, the drama that is like vaginal. Um, and in this case, you know, she is really, Edie is a character who is, who moves through the world, like led by her id. And that was really freeing to write, to watch a, a, a black woman move freely like that, you know, like at work, like you were saying, part of it is like, she works a job she doesn't really love. It's like, a, it doesn't really pay her super well either. And so she's finding pleasure where she can. And there is, it really is that a litany of, of men and like, I think a couple women um, where she is trying to feel something. And I wanted, you know, it's tricky, right? Like it's tricky when you write um, a character and later in the section with Eric, a character who um, invites a kind of like bodily obliteration, but it, it was important for me to make space for her to assert her agency in that way. Yeah, no, that makes so much sense. Um, we had Brian Washington on last month. He's a big fan of your book. In fact, before we announced him. it, it was like luster. Um, and the conversation that we had was sort of being honest about the trauma that someone experiences without centering the trauma in the life yeah. story, the way that it negates every other part of the person. Um, and so you have said that it was important to, to you that you not be fully defined by the pain that she's endured, yeah. um, but also that she not bear that trauma well, right? Or that it's, it's probable that it's affected her without defining her. So can you talk a little bit more about that? Totally. Um, so yeah, that was that was really important to me, specifically, you know, knowing that I was going to come to the page and try and um, depict a full, um, you know, portrait of, of a black woman. I felt immediately that I was working against the idea of, of a strong black woman, you know, the idea of, uh, a woman who we, we praise for her stoicism, um, for, for how well, like you said, that she, she bears pain. Like it was important for me to, um, to show a human response, to make room, you know, I think it's important to, um, to afford black women tenderness. And, and my, one of the ways I tried to do that was to uh, give her the latitude to have human responses you know, to not hold her to a standard of, of stoicism, you know, in the middle of the kind of like, I mean, brutality that she is kind of up against in her, in her many environments. Um, you know, it was important that she have something she loved, like disco. It, it'd be important that she, you know, that she be deeply carnal and unapologetic about it. Um, it, yeah, it was, it was just important too that when she's hurt, like, you know, that she's hurt, you know, she doesn't, bear this without complaint and also that she'd be wrong that she'd be fallible you know like it was really just incredibly important for me to um to allow her humanity on the page um and to you know to talk about her trauma in a way that still felt um less like pathology less like commodification but but just a human story yeah i also loved how Eric wasn't so much a matter of desire. Like he wasn't really an object of desire for her in some ways. Like it felt like she was just working it out in herself, if that makes sense. Um, yeah. And you always know that 
that he would be in an open marriage? And what was that decision about? Yes, um, I knew from the beginning at least that much. You know, I will say that um, one thing I didn't know was how much until I started writing toward it, Rebecca would come to the fore, you know, but I did know that um, starting off it would be an open marriage. I thought, um, you know, I, I love anything that, <laughs> any kind of affair centric, you know, art, I think is really interesting. Um, and I wanted to, I wanted to subvert that a little bit and create a, a, you know, arrangement in which these two people have invited this disruption, which kind of gives me more to work with and more to plumb in terms of like, why do they want this? You know, why, what is Rebecca, right? Like, why does she want this? Why does Eric want this? Um, but yeah, no, it was, <laughs> it was important for me to, to have that set because it allowed me just on a craft level to kind of introduce Rebecca's hand in the, in the arrangement really, really early on. Um, she's kind of, you know, in the background, even in those, those really, those early chapters. And it was just a, a kind of interesting way to, to organize that. So interesting and so different, similar, but distinct from sort of the other woman, like, right. Uh, factor the, the the unknown factor to have it known and accepted is such a strange I mean I'm fascinated by a polyamory and the dynamic and I mean like I I don't think I'm alone and sort of trying to understand what that would feel right. like that's right and you know what I thought about the other woman you know which is definitely like another kind of big subject um, to tackle I, th I thought about the way that it is normally um, kind of depicted uh, and I thought, you know, the other woman as like um, kind of a, <laughs> like just like a, a, a home wrecker, you know, and, and the wife, you know, the, the sort of as like a jealous, scold, kind of villainous, um, you know, side character, but it made more sense or it made more sense, but like it felt more interesting to depict um, the other woman as someone who is seeking, and the wife too is, is someone who is seeking, and to bring them toward each other, not in the way that they're fighting over this man, but they are trying to um, trying to make sense of this new order. You know, <laughs> it's really inevitably, I think, because an open marriage, like you know, it's predicated on rules, so it's an experiment in containment. It, it kind of it sets you up to break the rules. It sets you up to to break that containment and and introduce something more wild onto the page. Mm -hmm. No, for sure, and it's it's so well told in the way that Edie and Rebecca are by far the heroes of the story and the most interesting characters. I mean, so Eric is pretty unremarkable, right? Like he's a middle aged yeah. white man who drinks too much and is kind of clueless. Um, and Edie says, I think of all the gods I have made out of feeble men. Um, so why yeah. was that part of her pattern? And why, what were you trying to subvert? Because it feels like a bigger statement. Sure, I mean, I think, and you know, you asked earlier uh, how much of me is in this and like, I'm in there too, and I think a lot of young women are, are in there, you know, what it, what it, what it feels like, you know, when you're young and you're seeking and, you know, you are, the world is, I mean, the world is still wondrous, but like it's wondrous in a different way because there's still so much you don't know. And so you defer, you know, to, to older men because they've seen a little more and you look for affirmation in them. You know, you're sensitive and, and very susceptible to their power. And, you know, she, Edie is as well. You know, she looks to him for affirmation of her artistry. And that that really defines the, the beginning and kind of, yeah, just the beginning of that of that union until Edie begins to, to come into herself, to understand that she has value. Her experiences also have value that it isn't, you know, that just because she's a young woman, it doesn't mean she's an unserious person, you know, that she is a, a serious person um, who has experience um, that is, you know, that has worth. Um, and, you know, I guess throughout the book, there, there are people who are, who diminish her, you know, <laughs> and 
you know, I guess three times it's kind of like that, um, you know, everyone kind of has something to say about her generation specifically, and she desperately wants to be specific, you know. Um, and, you know, arg arguably, <laughs> arguably she is, you know, um, a person like many people are, are people. Um, and there are unspecific things about her, as Rebecca would say later on in the book. But, you know, that moment where she kind of has that come to Jesus moment and realizes that Eric, too, is kind of just a, is a human being, a deeply fallible one, a feeble one, you know? Um, it's a real reckoning with, with the way, you know, I have in life and the way she has kind of cobbled this this God from a man, you know, the way you can when you're kind of inside that sanctuary of your mind and, you know, she's built, like, as I think we all do, the theoretical thing uh, as opposed to what it is in the flesh. So that was a real, that was a really fun, not fun, but um, that was a relief to write. Um, it was almost like a, like a missive to a past self, <laughs> you know, 23 year old me, you know, like, um, it was, it was interesting to write that. Yeah. You say she's unspecific, but I feel like she's so specific and she just doesn't know how to express herself almost, or she doesn't know how to land in the world. And she almost needs this very unconventional, very charged sort of, I don't even know if you'd call it a power struggle with Rebecca, but this almost this holding, this tension. And then it seems like it liberates her in many ways, right? Like going and cutting up cadavers and understanding how the body works in a deeper way yeah. to asserting herself or asserting her ability to sit in discomfort um, and unknown, which is so remarkable. Um, what, like that, the power, the sort of unspoken power struggle between them was remarkable and the and the sexual energy and like what were you what was that about what were you trying to sort of get at like the undressing between the just the yeah. exchanging of clothes and all of it like what was that about so i think you know with that with that uh pairing uh and that's like that was the thing that really i think in the writing of this surprised me the, the way that this particular relationship came to the fore. And when it did, I then I kind of knew what I wanted to do with it, which was to, you know, to depict two women who are serious about their craft and kind of serious about themselves to kind of come together, but, you know, come together in a way that's complicated by the differences between them, but come together in a way that I feel is, is, is maybe, um, specific to women, you know, in a way that is urgent and immediate, you know, I, I, the conversations I have with, you know, my close girlfriends, or even honestly, I guess I should say like a woman that I, you know, I've just met, there's a, there's a thing that happens that is beautiful, that has only ever happened with women, where you start and you start right away, you know, you start deeply and profoundly and I wanted to speak to that romance that develops between women, especially women who are kind of hungry in their own way. And so in this book, you know, Edie and, and Rebecca are slowly revealing themselves to each other. And that is delayed here and there, that gratification, that kind of undressing is, is delayed um, because of the differences between them. They have to reconcile because of this arrangement. <laughs> kind of you know precludes them being best friends um you know but it is it was really it was really cool to be able to to build this intricate thing you know to be able to stoke this tension between these two women um and to be able to introduce um a person who takes Edie seriously when it comes to her craft you know and, and it was just it was a it was a thing like a relationship between women um, that I am always drawn to on in film and on the page and I, I wanted to replicate you know the way they can be romantic and, and serious and strange. Yeah. 
No, and it's it's so like the way that the everything is so off kilter and sort of unspoken or or unpredictable. Like just thinking about the fact that you know the money, whoever was giving it to her, showing up in like erratic amounts every week, et cetera. So obviously, race and class are huge themes of the book and sort of unspoken. And one of the things that you point out is sort of the mundane racism of every day. Um, so with Akila, that moment of where Akila's, I think it's the tutor, right? He says a monkey could do this. And then when she tries to talk to Rebecca about it and Rebecca's pissed, um, which who, who knows? And then you write, this is Edie thinking, it's almost too mundane for the deployment of the R word as with a certain sect of good white person, the accusation overshadows the act and then you write, racism is often so mundane, it leaves your head spinning, the hand of the ordinary in your slow psychic death, so sly and absurd, you begin to distress your own eyes. So she essentially shuts the conversation down. Um, when you were sort of going back, like what were, what were you considering in terms of her um, response? You know, it's interesting. I'll say that was a really hard, like it's funny, I'm, I'm both writing about how how hard it is to articulate those like lowercase iterations of racism, but it also was extremely hard for me to to um, articulate it on the page. And I will say, you know, this 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 is one of those fundamental differences, like a kind of lived experience versus um, a you know Rebecca's attempt to to do the best she can with the tool she has. You know, although in this moment it's arguable she's doing the best she can, but you know she is. Um, you know, understandably, right, defensive about this uh, sort of interloper coming in and and telling her that she hasn't seen this thing. Um, and, and Edie is braced for that, you know, but also, <laughs> also aware that this risk that she's taking to, to articulate this um, is, a, uh, is a tricky one because it's, you know, and this was important to me to talk about the, the the kind of racism that is not you know hyper legible that is not um, kind of hinged on the I mean is iconography the right word I should probably not you know but that we're really familiar with in terms of of understanding racism the, the parts that are quotidian the parts the parts that are everyday and that are because they're everyday extremely hard to articulate and believe that you've seen, especially in a world that is um, invested in um, in saying that there is nothing there, right? <laughs> there, there is, so in this moment, it was, um, it was, I was trying to, to talk bluntly about really truly kind of the, the difficulty as a human person, you know, <laughs> um, trying to sift through these almost subliminal, um, you know, parts of racism and articulate it and articulate it to a person who is not necessarily villainous, but that's also important too, but also not super open to hearing it. You know, later on um, that is resolved, but yeah, that was, you know, that was, that was a tricky section. <laughs> I thought too that the, the whole concept of Akilah's hair too, right? And this sort of forced assimilation into this family and then this refusal to acknowledge that maybe her needs couldn't be met in that community fully. Mm -hmm. And was so also well told, just, you know, Edie taking her to get her hair done and yeah. sort of entering into her world um, rather than this, it felt like the way that she was written, like Akilah was just sort of plopped into their world um, yeah. with this expectation of assimilation. And so that I thought was like a, a really beautiful detail or just their, their yeah. burgeoning yeah. love story um, as awkward at moments as it was to be friends with his, her dad's girlfriend. Right. <laughs> I mean, the whole you know, and, and like that was important to me that they have camaraderies that you know some camaraderie some kinship between them like that relationship is one in which Edie actually does find 
um, kin, the kind of kin that she's like reaching for and the kind that Akila is too. Like, you're right. Like now when Edie is introduced to the environment, into this house, um, it becomes apparent in a different way. All of the, the things that she ha hasn't been told, hasn't been taught because, you know, the people who are kind of, you know, in charge of that tutelage, they do not have a lived experience, right? They don't know how to, how to tend to her hair. They don't know um, how to brief her on how to interact with police. Like later on in the book, Edie yeah. sees that. And, and you know, and, I, and Akila, the reason that she's brought in, you know, Edie is brought into the house is because Rebecca, she, she's not doing super well socially. And, and part of it is this, is that she is in an environment which um, she cannot be adequately witnessed. And to find your bearing, um, to understand yourself and, and also your blackness, you know, even though like I, I tried to make it in this book that, you know, not to great, make any grand statements about what blackness should be, but to find her, you know, her own blackness in this space um, is, is difficult. And so she, you know, what she finds with Edie is a kind of comfort and a kind of tutelage, um, and a kinship that they really both need. Yeah. So here's an audience question. How long did it take you to actually write Lester? It felt like it was all cooked up and then you sat down and it poured out. And I would add to that, that it also felt if I had to project or guess, that maybe the editing of it was the most laborious part because every sentence went somewhere. You know, it's it's very spare um, in a way that I think is probably way harder to do than to write sort of a 300 page novel. It worked so hard. So how long, what was the process? So um, this entire book, like just to get the first draft out, it took a year. Um, I started it in my second year in my MFA and was just writing like a demon, you know, like I had a full time job and I was in school full time. So I went to work and I went to class like, twice a week and then I would go home and, and write, just write, you know, and, uh, you know, the sentence, I love the sentence level and I, I, <laughs> it's nice to hear you say that, you know, I do want that to be apparent that like language is important to me, that surprise is important to me, that you feel the joy in the writing, um, and that also you have a good time, you know, with the writing. Um, and so it, even though it took me a year, you know, I, like one day would just be like <laughs> one paragraph, you know, I, I am, the way I write is that I cannot move forward unless it feels at the moment perfect, you know? And, you know, inevitably the next day I look at the draft and it is horrible and I have to like erase them. But, um, you know, I really, really, I'm really careful. I'm really careful even with the very first draft and, and edits just tightened it up. My, my, my glorious editor, Jenna Johnson, you know, we, we revised over a summer and we just polished it up. Well. It's amazing. Um, I want to go back to Akila one more time and then we'll get to another audience question. But um, I know in your personal life, you went to, you left your faith and went to Comic-Con, right? You wrote an essay yeah. about it in Esquire. Um, and what, so what was Akila's connection to fandom about in that whole world? Sure. Yeah. I mean, you know, again, like part of this was, um, my preoccupation with with fandom and my joy making its way onto the page you know same with disco um but i i wanted like we were talking about earlier and talking about depictions of, of trauma you know um akila is a, is a young really young person who has had her fair share of, of trauma and i tried to be careful and subtle in, in how i introduced that but i also was really important for me to, for her to have something that she that she really loved to have her have joy and for me fandom is like a real kind of instant portal to that kind of mission statement um, because fandom at least how I feel like 
it's observed best is the kind that is about love, you know, the kind that is about like communion. And um, I just wanted, I wanted Akila to have that, you know, that, that joy and also like, like that communion, right? Cause in the book, she's kind of missing that community. Um, and it was, yeah, I just wanted to, I just wanted to talk about that and, and kind of write about, <laughs> write about Comic-Con. It's such a fascinating world and I don't know. I can, I, I am, I've never been, but someday I'm dying. Yeah. Not, I know I hate dressing up in costumes, but I would enjoy the spectacle of it. Is it a party foul? Is it like going out on Halloween? No, no, you don't have to do that. About a costume? Yeah. Um, <laughs> so what, what are you working on now? So, I mean, right now I am not working on any new project, but I'm, cause I'm mostly just taken up with launching the book, but I'm really excited about, I have a few, a handful of things I really want to get to. Um, I have a few, I have a handful of books still in me. <laughs> I would imagine. Are you, is this going to be a movie or a TV show? Oh God. I mean, I hope so. <laughs> It seems it seems perfect for it. Um, this is another audience question. It's a good. I know we're sort of out of time. What what are you reading now, and what are you loving, or what what are you excited to read? I love. Um, I think. I mean. I think actually, you you worked with her already, but Pam Zhang's "How Much of These Hills Is Gold." I think yeah. that she's brilliant. Um, I really love "A Burning" by Mega Majumdar. Um, I really love Lakewood by Megan Giddings. Um, I love Cool for America by Andrew Martin. Um, and I think A House is a Body by Shruti Swami. Um, and yeah, I mean, there's just there's so many great books. A Transcendent Kingdom by Yagi Asi just came out today. Uh, is oh. extremely brilliant. Um, yeah. <laughs> Uh, her that home going is so amazing. I yeah, it yes. feels like a very exciting time for fiction. Yes, yes. Like truly, um, feels sort of unparalleled. Or maybe because we're all home and a little bit more captive audience. Like it just yes. feels. So I feel like t the covers are getting better. I don't know. It seems exciting. Um, well, thank you for your book. It was a gift, and thank you for your time. And thank you. Uh, it was lovely talking to you and thinking about sex and desire and all the spicy stuff. And I cannot wait for your next book. So I hope, I hope you start on one soon. Thank you so much. Bye Raven. And I'm gonna announce the next book. Um, this is our first memoir. It's Carrie by um, Tony Jensen. I think it's the most stunning cover again, just talking about how amazing covers are. Um, the subtitle is A Memoir of Survival on Stolen Land, and it is a striking poetic record of what it means to be an indigenous woman in America, which is obviously very relevant to everything that's happening now and sort of since the formation of this country. Um, it's beautiful, deeply affecting, and the story will immediately hook you in. Um, so please join us and you can go talk in our Facebook group where we ha and you can also go to the site goop.com slash goop book club where we have links to all of that and a reading guide and I'll be back here with Tony on the 30th to talk about the book. So please bring your questions and as always, thank you for reading along. <laughs>